and we were live. <laughs> um, so at the moment, I've just got us on a split screen, okay? Oh, yes, that's fine. Just says, done, redirecting to the Facebook Live page. And we should be live any moment now. I'm sorry if people are already tuned in. Uh, does it stay live on yours? Not yet. So it's like, it just takes a few seconds to kick in. Uh, come on. Any time now. Ooh. Ah, we're live on Facebook. Ah, just brilliant, perfect timing. So I bet you I've been wittering on again. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome and thank you for joining us. And finally, I'm delighted to say we're finally delighted by actress Ethna Brown. Ethna, how are you? I'm really well, and I'm, I'm really honestly happy to be here with you tonight. It's great. Well, thank you. I'm very excited that you're here, but I know you're very excited at the moment and you're all dying to tell us all about your new work and stuff as well, because you've got lots of work in the pipeline, haven't you? So dying to hear all about that. Yeah, I no, I, I've, I've been lucky. I've had the last, where are we, 12, 15 months. Yeah, God, yeah. It's gone quick and then slow in one way. Yeah. Um, all my work last year was cancelled. I thought I was going to have a nice year. I had three jobs lined up. Yeah. I was going to be doing Mamma Mia at the Royal Court. Wow, in the yeah. And then I was going to be doing um, Masquerade. Yeah, oh. No, again, in Liverpool. Great. I was actually uh, on tour, just starting a tour. Um at the beginning of the year when we were all sent home. Yeah, oh no. I was really upset because it was a beautiful project that I'd worked really hard on um, no. to help get it to its creation. Five weeks rehearsal and we got three performances in and we were sent home. Oh, no. And you were just like, and I was like, I've learned this yeah. character. And uh, to all Brookside watchers, Johnny McArdle was playing my husband. Oh, I thought, yes, that's yeah. brilliant. So what's going to happen with that then? When theatres hopefully reopen, is it, going to, is it still in the air or is that going to continue? Well, it, it, it's hard to say because it, it was a lot of theatre productions made now are joint productions mm. between two, three, maybe more theatres. So they all bear the brunt of the cost. Mm. And this was between Leeds Playhouse, where it was born. We were actually in the Queen's Theatre in Hornchurch when we opened. And it was going to um, a theatre, uh, where were we going to as well? Uh, Leicester, Kevin Leicester, we're, we're going to go there. Um, so it, it's it's whether or not those stars ever align again. Yeah, you know? it's, so, it's it's all it's, up in the air at the moment, isn't it? It's, oh, it's, Maggie it's, May. <laughs> she was beautiful because um, I'd taken a couple of trips over to the Playhouse. Mm. And it was about a woman who gets early dementia but will not accept it, doesn't want a friend to know, does not want her son to know. And while that might seem like a very upsetting, miserable sort of, it was joyous, it really was, and it was hopeful. And at the end of it, it's like, right, okay, this is how we deal with this. This yeah. is my, I can do this. Um, the music was great, beautiful set. And we had a great director and a lady called Jemima Levitt. Um, guy played my son, we had this quite emotional scene. We both really got into it. We used to sort of, you know, get quite genuinely upset. You know, mm. I'll never forget your son. Do you promise, Mum? I can't promise, but... And we'd end up, and <laughs> Jemima would shout, stop crying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a happy play. Yeah. He's not miserable. No, but I am. <laughs> yeah. Happy but sad and poignant. Kind it of was thing. beautiful. It was beautiful. So hopefully that will get the chance to be seen again because... There were lots of pointers in it mm. and how to live with this condition, call it what you will, that more and more and more people are living with. So it was a beautiful thing to do. I looked like a bag of spuds. So, I mean, <laughs> I didn't, you know, I really did. I just, I just yeah. jumped, jumped about the place with my pinny on. <laughs> I'm wearing this, are you sure? <laughs> what is it? She was just a normal, ordinary housewife, wasn't she, living the way yeah. she lived? So, yeah, that, so... Fingers crossed that that might come back. Yeah, fingers crossed, because that sounds a lovely play and obviously something that was going to go down really well as well, so it's a shame. You got yeah. to sing and dance and laugh as well as, you know, the you, you got the payoff with the little emotional scenes because everybody had a hoot by then, you know, so, mm. yeah. But everybody who worked on it deserves to see it, so. 
Mm. Of course. And I mean, talking about theatre and stuff, I mean, we take, well, I suppose we all did, we all took it for granted, you know, going to concerts and theatres. And now I'm looking back and thinking, I really didn't appreciate, you just take it all for granted, don't you? And then I'm thinking, I can't wait till theatres and, or, you know, concerts can go back open again and we can return to well, normal. I mean, my, my burlesque act has gone to bits. <laughs> well, I could imagine uh, it's awful for a lot of uh, actors and musicians at the moment, isn't it? So much work's been cancelled. How do you get back from that? You know, for a lot of people, that's a whole year gone, you know, mm. your training, whatever. I mean, you're living, you know. Hard. It, it's, it's scary because we just, it's still, there's a question mark hanging over it still, isn't there? Yeah, and that's very what's sad. Yeah, when we have a bit of light at the end of a tunnel and we know for certain that theatre's going to open again. Yeah, that's when we can sort of, you know. Well, we have got some questions about your current and upcoming work as well later on. But are you ready to go back in time? <laughs> da, 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 da. Well, we're taking you back to Brookside, but we've got a few things before then, if you don't mind talking about that, because, yep. yes. Are you ready for question one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So exciting. Well, I have to write them all down, you see. So <laughs> so I write them down how I'm going to talk them. So when I'm looking down, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just reading off this. <laughs> Are you going to score points on it, how I answer? Oh, no, no. You've just... Be spontaneous. Be spontaneous. <laughs> I find it hard to talk. <laughs> oh, me too, me too. Can't you tell? I'm very shy and reserved. <laughs> oh, that would be right. Well, this is actually going back, I believe, to the beginning of your career, um, or very early on, because first of all, you appeared in the practice playing uh, Mrs. McCluskey, followed by uh, Muriel in the TV miniseries, The Marksman, uh, before appearing in the film, Business as Usual, playing Trisha Lane. Uh, now, I have to ask about this film, as it boasted such an all-round fantastic cast, including Glenda Jackson, John yeah. Thor, and Kathy Tyson, just to name a few. I think Michelle Byatt even had um, a part in that as well. And she was in Brookside too. So I just wondered about that film. Was that your, one of your earliest films? It, it was early on. Um, mm. I was really, really pleased to get it. It was quite mm. exciting. Um, I have to say straight off, Glenda Jackson, when I worked with her, she was absolutely brilliant. Um, very warm very strict but you learned a lot from how she worked you know there was no messing you mm. did your job um bit of a devil great eyes you know for like come with me follow me i'm doing this i love yeah. that really alive but full of really good advice the next job i think it, the marksman came after business as usual and oh, the one to drive yeah which was a big thing for me and she was like oh darling tell them to put you on a low loader get a flat <laughs> truck you know <laughs> <laughs> But very positive about, don't be scared to ask for this. Mm. You know, they want you, so you say, you know, I, I really liked it. I didn't work a lot with John. I knew Kathy, mm. I said anyway, and I got, you know, getting really well with her. That was, that, that was lovely. And I was working at home. Um, I think the one thing that didn't happen about, for business as usual, there was a great big denouement scene for me, which was filmed in, what were then the very new houses in front of the Anglican Cathedral. Oh, okay. so I had a big scene in there where it was all big drama and, you know, I'm not going to do this and that, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then when it came to it, we didn't have permission to be in there and the owners wouldn't let us do Oh, no way. So what it's, happened? Oh. You get, it went. I was yeah. looking for it and it just, it diminished everything really, but that happened. Mm. Um, you, you've got no control. You know, re and recently in Emmerdale, I noticed this as well. Um, you've got no control over how they edit something. Mm. So it was a bit of an upset, but it didn't take away from the experience of, yeah. of with all those people. You know, it was it was brilliant. And yeah. look at and how great is it to have on your CV as well, working with the likes of Glenda Jackson and stuff. <laughs> there you go. There you go. See, great. <laughs> well, because... Um, you actually appeared, uh, arrived in Brookside Close in 1987 as Chrissy Rogers, but actually prior to that, I think it was even before Business as Usual, you actually appeared in an episode um, in a completely different role as Lindsay Mulholland, who was the host of a Close Party get-together at Doreen's. Can you remember that? 
I think <laughs> I like one of your lines where you said the fabric's the second choice of Fergie's wedding or something like that. <laughs> what I can remember is the, the clothes they put me in. I, it was this long skirt, and I'm, I'm quite a short piece of work, but it's sort of this long skirt. You actually, I don't think you can see my feet. It looked like I was being wheeled around on casters. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I was supposed to be selling all of these clothes, and I sort of looked a bit, thought, do I look a bit dowdy? I looked terribly short. And um, so I, I'd come out without my shoes on. Yes. So, but I do remember it was at um, quite a crucial time in storylines because it was after the big attack on Sheila and it was how she reacted to all of that. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, Sue John, what an amazing one. I learned such Brilliant a lot actress, from, yeah. from watching her when I then came into Rookie Proper. Um, mm. But but then it was just such a gas. There was very little responsibility on me. And I mean, I had this little part so you could sit back and just enjoy it, you know. Yeah, and she was quite a funny sort of bubbly character and stuff. And she was very passionate and into what she was doing and stuff. And I liked that. It was <laughs> we great. never saw her again. <laughs> I went to speak. <laughs> <laughs> saw my clothes around the outlying districts of Liverpool. Oh, well, that's it. <laughs> well, we I mean, did that have any effect on you going to, or was that completely a different audition when you went for a, because Chris, because that was about a year later, wasn't it? They, I mean, obviously they knew of me and apparently they had had designs to try and use me because local, a good age for a character to come in, mm. um, not that well known. So, you know, so that, that was sort of, um, you know, they'd noted it, put it that way. Yes. Um, That's good though, because John McArdle played a different character before he came in, his Billy as well, didn't he? Yeah. And Justine <laughs> Kerrigan. Yeah. Oh, and, and even your <laughs> husband, Peter Christian, he played, just confusing enough, a Frank, but not your Frank. It was a completely different Frank, just to confuse you. And he had quite big curly hair. That was in the 1982 episodes I watched. Okay, I can very, yeah. I only play people <laughs> called Frank. All right. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit like that. He was a bit more of a scally in this part, though. <laughs> I think he threatened Barry or somebody. Or, oh, I can't remember now. But yeah, he was quite um, a bit of a heavy, I think. He was yeah. one of um, Gavin's friends. Do you remember Gavin and Petra? Yeah, he was one of those friends. And because he was called Frank, I was thinking, well, I don't remember Frank being in it this early. And then I realised, obviously, it was a different character altogether. So just to confuse you. <laughs> well, when, um, because I've got a question for you off um, a Cole Taylor. Um, it's something I'm interested in as well. I've got on your Brookside um, subject, because, <coughs> excuse me, viewers first saw you as Chrissy in December 1987. Um, one of the things I noticed when I was looking back on those early episodes, I didn't remember this, um, there was a different actress playing Katie Burke before Diane Burke. Um, mm. So can you remember why the first actress was replaced? If you sort of think about it, I'm not a, you wouldn't want me as your mother because really? Jeff came back with a different head. <laughs> yeah, he did, didn't he? Yes. <laughs> Kevin have, Carson. And all my children, either the children that I'm, I've played mother to in various parts. Like if you think about the marksman, I mean, my first job was Blood Brothers and two children went in that. You know, I'm possibly not the best person to play a mum. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think, I, I, I do remember it. And I, re I remember feeling very much for the first Katie because she was only little. Yes. She had to go back to school after all the fuss of being on Brookside to be replaced by somebody else. And that was quite hard. But I think she was only very young and she came from quite, um, a drama school background. So mm. it, you, you do need different talents to work in on stage as you do to on television. Mm. Television, everything is pared down. Um, you know, it's, you've got to sort of pull everything back. Yeah. And I think that's a problem with directors trying to get her to be less, less, less. When she's a young, vibrant thing, who just wants to give more, more, more. Yeah, she was um, very energetic. <laughs> yeah, very energetic. And so when Diane Burke came in, who is of her, her own nature a quieter, more reserved, you know, but very lively person. Mm. She slip into the role better and be more comfortable in herself in it. And it was really funny, you know, years, years later after I'd left, I was sitting watching a play in the Everyman and I just got a tap on the shoulder and I just said something, hiya mum. And it was Diane. Are you <laughs> was, joking? <laughs> love that, I love that. But I had a lovely relationship with them and felt very motherly towards them. I got, like I've still got somewhere, 
a little present that Diane's mum gave me with a card to say thank you for being, you know, such a good second mum. And I'm in touch with um, Jeff um, and, of course, you know, Rachel. He's a school teacher now, isn't he? He's a headmaster, yeah. Oh, yeah. headmaster, sorry, <laughs> yes. When you think about it, it was quite funny for a boy who had dyslexia. Yeah. And then, I, and again, terrible mother. I was supposed to be at teacher's training college. I didn't even notice my son couldn't read it. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there was a part actually. You've just now you've just said that. Wasn't there a time where Jeff left school or you had homeschooling from Chrissy at one point? I'm yep. sure I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And yeah. I can remember um, another memory just popped in. It's funny now. All these memories are coming back. There was a part where. Um, Jeff and Bumper, I think they'd been smoking or something, and they'd set the post box on fire or something. Can you remember that? That was quite... Yeah, these are very, very early memories I've got of that. So, yeah. But if you think about it, you know, my family, um, the eldest one drank. Oh, Second Sammy, one... yes, yes. Sammy! <laughs> Second one couldn't read, and the third one was bullied, and I knew none of this. <laughs> no, I know, well... This is Chrissy for you, terrible mother. Now, see, Chrissy, she seemed like everyday mother to me. Like, she was very responsible. She was, you know. It's true. There, were, there was a point as well that I used to say to them I could go on when I left Brookside to get a job at the potato marketing board or something because all I did was peel spuds and get the kids <laughs> off. And that's how you could tell I was a good mother. Yeah, but, she was very mum, mumsy, wasn't very, she? Very, very yeah. mum. Because I used to think Frank must have something on her. Yeah. <laughs> she must have something on Frank, rather. Um, but there was also a time when they brought in, um, who was it, uh, an actor to, um, I was, Chrissy was going to have an affair with. Oh. So thinking, oh, great, you know, steamy afternoons in the Adelphi and what have you, you know. I think he was As playing you a do. doctor. Well, I was thinking, yeah, is he playing a doctor? Could you just offer this corn? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> not being so great. <laughs> but when it came to it, we did this thing where Chrissy, you know, came to, to a census, I think we crocs of heart, and I ran off, you know, and the heel on my shoe broke, so it was all very pathetic. And I was like, Oh, God. <laughs> did we just go to the Adelphi? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't recall that. Yeah, 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 it was great. Yeah, well, I, I don't know if you're going to agree with this statement because I was going to say, because this is question four, the Rogers were a fairly normal, mm, happy family, uh, debatable. Um, they seemed it on the surface. Um, but there were a lot of problems. Um, oh, yes, yeah, such as Sammy's alcoholism, which I thought was handled really well. Uh, those scenes with Rachel Lindsay, like I put a clip up of you yesterday where you confronted her in the off license. Um, I wondered how what your first thoughts were on that because that time Brookside was still really issue led at that time, weren't it? Wasn't it? I think, I think it was really good. Mm. I remember there was a wonderful director called Joe Johnson as well who handled. The situation um, with Rachel and um, as Sammy, yeah, um, she she wanted to get the best out of it, and that really showed as a director. She'd gone into a lot of detail and mm. just set the scene so that Rachel could give give up her best as a yeah. young actress doing this very difficult thing, you know. Because bear in mind, especially in Liverpool, anything you do on the screen, people take seriously, mm. so you have to be protected. I also remember when. Um, the situation we had when we explored Jeff's dyslexia. Now we went down to the House of Lords mm. with them. Wow. Yeah, yeah. No we had way. to the House of Lords. Um, we met Roald Dahl that day. You know, it was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Travel back on the train later on. And I went into Maranto's on Lark Lane that evening, having come home, just going to eat. And the lady stopped me in the toilets who'd seen the interview on children's television. That was one of the reasons we'd gone there. Saturday morning telly and she'd seen the interview and she said I just want to say thank you very much she said because my son has dyslexia and all of this makes it much easier she said I had it but it wasn't diagnosed I used to think I was stupid I mm -hmm. didn't want to and you're suddenly struck with someone telling you a life story this very important thing um and you realise that, yeah, it has to be done properly. I was, I was really proud it of that. It's really touching that somebody comes up to you and says, well, I agree with that. You've made me feel better. That's a sense of achievement, isn't it? Oh, it was just... It's just that thing where, you know, the nonsense of an acting career hits the truth of a real life. Yeah. And, and soaps do. And, I mean, people 
criticise soaps, don't they? But there's a lot of snobbery out there about soaps. And I just think they work so hard and they do some, and you know, they handle these issues they, so sensitively. Yeah, so, so the whole of them, they, they use the, uh, you know, the Rogers family mm. to look at things like bullying, mm. uh, to look at things like dyslexia and how you try and hide it and, you know, and then to look at the alcohol, uh, alcoholism rather at that young age, mm. or the, that falling into alcohol, which young people can do. Um, and I think, yeah, yeah, that they, they really were good issues to examine with young, brave actors, as yeah, they were. Yeah, definitely. Because Danny were... McCall's another one, wasn't he? Hmm? Sorry. Danny McCall's another good actor who was in that at that time, wasn't he? Because he, I think that's how Sammy's alcoholism started, wasn't it? Wasn't it that big joyride car crash? He'd drive anybody to drink, Danny McCall. <laughs> Well, I mean, I looked at that car crash episode and the way it hurled over and went down this bank, I thought there's no way they could live through that. But no, the next episode they were on life support and Sammy was OK, but Owen was in a wheelchair and that's where all the problems started. Yeah, I remember filming in the hospital and while it was ho, 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 because you're just getting ready for work and it's a day's work and you sort of do that until you go into performing your scenes and then it's... Yeah, you're completely in it. But there was something about, again about being in the hospital and you were aware of life going mm. on around you, life going wrong around you for some mm. people. And it, again, it was quite a very different um, atmosphere mm. to, to work in. And, and it was, and it benefited Made it from it. all real and natural. Yeah, completely, yeah. Mm. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Well, are you ready for question five? I am, Ian. You are, yes. This is a bit more of a detailed one. I want your opinion on this one. So, because I liked how Chrissy was uh, very um, driven, passionate, and often... Um, it's all right, I couldn't read my own writing there. Um, she, you know, she'd always stand up for her beliefs. It was a bit like Bobby Grant, actually. Um, and I mean, not that it matters as it was your character, but were there any similarities to your political views to Chris's? Um, or I mean, was there anything that you played which you imagined would really go against your grain that Chrissy had done? Or were they in line with you? Yeah, no. Very, I, I think very, very much. Sometimes I would go and argue the toss for the character. Mm. Um, I think I probably made myself quite unpopular with people on a higher level because I believed in it and I wanted it to be right. Um, There's nothing wrong with that. True, and um, mm, I, I, I might approach it differently as an adult. But, yeah. but um, now, you know, but, but then I, I did, I really believed in it, and I would go and argue for things if I didn't think it was right, or I'd, she wouldn't say that, or she wouldn't do that, or why have you asked her, you know, um, where it felt completely, you know, sometimes they'd ask you to go down a, a road that you'd know there'd be no coming back from. Yeah. Yeah. Or, in, you know, in three weeks' time, you'd be back to this again, so that journey wouldn't make sense. Um, but, but no, really, I believe Chrissy existed. You know, she was just an everyday mum. Mm. Um, and, you know, and sometimes that could be a bit boring to play. <laughs> yeah, no, you were playing a mom. She had to be responsible, didn't she? Although I like the sound of the affair, though. That would have been fun. <laughs> maybe, maybe Chrissy could have got with Barry Grant. Um, oh, no. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think Chrissy would like the bad boy type, would she? Oh, no, Christian Rodska was yes. the guy who played the guy, the guy she had the affair with, the actor Christian Rodska. And it was wonderful to work with somebody who came in, you know, out of the acting sphere sort of thing. That was completely different. So yeah. it was, and again, a challenge, you know, which is great. Of course, yes. definitely. OK, well, I'm just going to ask you, this is quite a simple question. What were some of your favourite stories and scenes during your stint as Chrissy? I imagine you've got quite a few. Well... I know we're going back quite a while now. <laughs> I know, yeah. No, 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 I, I, I do know. I, I did... Um, I like the sort of the scenes when we're all out in the close. Yes. You know, and you, you get to see the different neighbours because quite often as a family you'd work in isolation. Yes. It was... I mean, one of the best things was once they, they took us... I, I read the script and went straight to the producer. They took us to Southport Fair. And there's a the thing where Chrissy and her friend were going to get on a, you know, a, ro a roller coaster. <laughs> so, really sorry. I, I just haven't got the body for, for fairs. I got taken yeah. off the pillar at 20. I just can't be doing with it. 
Um, so I had to say to them, I, look, you can put me on it and I'll go on it, but I won't be able to do anything if you take me off. Yeah. So one of the extras was made up and I actually just got dressed in surfboard. She put my clothes on, the coat and stuff, and she did the, the whole roller coaster thing. Oh, wow. <laughs> but it was great. We were out of the clothes and it was like a party atmosphere. We were on holiday, the crew were having a great time with it. Um, and once that was accepted that um, they weren't going to make me, you know, go on this machine, um, I could just <laughs> and enjoy it then. Yeah. I think I've seen a publicity photo of you on a carousel or something, actually. Well, I presume that was the day. There might have been something of me on a carousel. I can do a carousel. I was on a carousel once in um, Scotland. Oh, it might have been there then. Right. Yes, it was. There was, a, there was one of those incredible furs that came for a day. Yes. Oh, the travelling furs. Yeah. Went the next day and it was gone. Oh, so nice. I was doing um, a, a musical called The Secret Garden up in uh, St Andrews. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. I can, yeah, I can do, I think it might have been that. I can, I can do a carousel. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. But just not the big roller coasters, the dips and upside down. I'm terrible yeah. for things like that. I still, even though I'm in my 40s now, I still like roller coasters. <laughs> see, it could have been you. Yeah, let's see, it could have been me. I'm just, I'm just a big kid. Oh, that's what it is. <laughs> um, question seven. Oh, now, because I know we can talk about this because I can only imagine how gold on the cast were to work with because um, in your era, when you joined, you had the likes of Ricky Tomlinson, Sue Johnston, John McCardle, just to name a few in the cast. So did you mingle much? Because I know that all the families often sort of were in their own little bubbles. It's like you said, when you came outside. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it was lovely. As I say, I learned a lot from just watching Sue Johnson. Mm. I saw my first episode of Brookside, the first couple. It just looked like every emotion known to man went across my face. It was just like, you know, I just watched this wiggling face of mine. And I noticed, I just learned from Sue, she has a stillness. Mm. And just a look, and she wouldn't react straight away, whatever she pulled back, and everything was so considered. Mm. And Calm and so that when she came out of it, you know, it was, it was, she was just lovely to watch, such a good actress. Yeah. Um, my friend, it, it was great to be friendly with her while we were on Brookside together. Mm. We had a real laugh, we were very naughty. Oh, do tell us more. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, uh, oh, you know, um, Mickey Stark, I'm working with Mickey Stark at the moment. We're doing, uh, we're rehearsing at the moment to put like a cabaret on at the Blackburn House Bistro. Brilliant. So I do it quite regularly. Um, of David Edge that I did Blood Brothers with and Mickey and a lovely guitarist uh, here in Liverpool, David Marrick. So wow. the three of us, um, four of us are working together, but Davey, Mickey and I sing together in harmony and it's just, it's joyous. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that Michael's actually a musician as well, isn't he? Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what he does is so unique and so on Sinbad like you know he's not Sinbad he's this lovely actor who can play him yeah of course uh, wonderful voice so um yes so Mickey that's something to look forward to as well so <laughs> have you got any dates prepared for that yet because I, I suppose that's a silly question to ask. no well we, we did have it's changed twice mm. um we're hoping now it's going to be around the 23rd maybe towards the end of May it was going to be outside on the 16th, but the weather's now proving. Uh, yeah, completely okay. erratic. I mean, last, a couple of weeks ago, I was in my T-shirt. I'm in my jumper tonight and the heating's on. <laughs> no, and it's something, if you're asking people to sit outside for a couple of hours, um, which we're prepared to do, you know, but all of a sudden it's now looking like that might come off. And also, people when people come to see us, there's food and drink and everything. So I'm thinking about the staff who have to prepare that and look after yeah. it. Food at the cafe at Blackburn House is brilliant. So people come for that as well. Mm. Mm. So it's a nice, you know, we feed you and then we entertain you. That sounds great. The Blackburn House, it's really popular. So I get to see Mickey. Yeah, well, I'm going to have to keep an eye on your uh, Twitter because I actually asked um, Mickey, um, try and get, if you want to sort of do some promotion, try and get you on together if you're ever interested. Yeah. Get some dates and stuff, that'd be brilliant. I'll tell him. Yes, yes. Well, I have invited him, so I do. And don't forget, we've got the summer reunion coming up as well. Yeah. Yeah, which will be really good fun. Yeah. Um, Lewis as well, Lewis Emmerich. Oh, Lewis, um, yes. We did, uh, he got in touch with me and would I do a reading for, you know, like a self-tape for him. And it was so funny. He got the job, which was great. 
but he had to sort of shout through my letterbox and I had to shout back. Yeah. Where I live here. And somebody is who going past me, uh, are you all right there? <laughs> no, we're just acting, we're just yeah. acting. <laughs> the, the lovely thing is that it, it worked and he, he got the role. So yeah, that, that was great. That was great. So I do see um quite a few of the Brookside actors around, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Justine and I have, have connected um, through Twitter again, you know, which is which is really nice. Yeah. Kate Gerald, the lovely Doreen Corkill. Yes. Uh, I don't see so much of Kate now. She's in London, but there's always a card on her birthday and things like that, you know. Well, yeah. she's being she's going to be invited to the um, reunion as well. I don't know if she'll participate, but at least the invites there, I thought. So yes. it's going to be great. Um, well, I, I did invite, well, I haven't invited Kevin yet, Kevin Carson, to the um, reunion, but I did ask if he wanted an interview. I don't think, he, he was very nice about it. I don't think he really likes that sort of thing anymore. So, which is fair enough. A lot of actors have left now, haven't they? Yeah. Um, that's the thing when you when you move on to another life, mm. you don't want people to just think, oh, you were, you were, you, you used to be, that's the thing, isn't it? Oh, you used to be. Well, yes. And you this, want them to think of what you're doing now. And this now. And, yeah. you know, that's great too. So, yeah, I understand that completely. Yeah, because I, I know there's like Sheila O'Hara, who nobody's ever heard of since she left. And I thought she was fantastic as Karen. Oh. I would love really? to talk to her. Nobody knows where she is. And I suppose if she's not on social media and stuff, I case, it's a case. She went travelling. Yeah. Great girl, great girl. Yeah. But I mean, if she's ever watching on the off chance, please do get in touch. You never know, she could be watching now. <laughs> um, oh, and hello to Neil, by the way, your son. He's always very helpful to me, by the way. He always sends me pictures of Madonna and Diana Ross on Twitter. Yes, he's very helpful to me. If he finds something that somebody likes, he likes to then, you know, participate. He does. He sent me loads of things, some really good pictures yeah. I've never seen, so very appreciative of that. He's got this brilliant brain, of course, so he will find things and go down corridors that you know we wouldn't bother with or, or, or notice. But no, he loves to do that. And the thought that he's um, passing something on from one yeah. person to another, it's great. Oh, yeah. I always appreciate it. And he's a uh, musician himself, isn't he? He, he drums and yeah. sings and, yeah, all sorts of stuff, yeah. yeah. Sings, oh, brilliant. So we're coming to see Neil soon then in a concert, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, right. Well, this is a very interesting one because this is some this is about Brookside again, because it's something I picked up on when re-watching many scenes from Brookside. I never thought about it at the time because I was only a kid. Um, it was something I was discussing with Sheila Greer last week. The writers often paired the ladies up with a man. Um, I'm, I'm just for example, Sheila, when Bobby and Sheila had split up, she then got with Billy, which I loved, thanks to John and Sue. They I love their great performances yeah. but I imagine somebody like Sheila would have you know soldiered on and because she was religious in that way I can't believe she divorced Bobby let alone remarry and that's something Sue had said and they kind of did the same with Amanda Burton's character and um mm. they kept sort of marrying her off and I thought I always uh, thought her character was strong and independent and I just wondered what your take was that I know we're on a we're living in a diff well we were living in different times back then but did you have any thoughts on that? Do you think sometimes it's written like a woman couldn't live without a man? I think I think you're absolutely right because mm. that there wasn't any one single woman living on her own. No, and I thought somebody like Sheila and I think Heather would have been Amanda yeah. Burton's character would have been interesting on her yeah. own for a while. So you could have explored that, um, Sheila certainly, but they they put Sheila of an age and a type as it were and I suppose Chrissy was exactly the same mm. where it was almost your duty to marry remarry look after the children mm. you know book stew um and, and carry on that way I think that's a really valid question because mm. we, we talk about the things that Brookside was really good at addressing those issues yes um, and you, you know we know about the lesbian kiss we know about the drugs we know about all of that business but yeah a strong woman living on her own didn't really happen, did it? No. It was just something I'd picked up on. I don't want to criticise anybody's work, but yeah, no. I just thought there was, there were women that could be, I believe would be independent and would be able to stand yeah. on their own two feet. Didn't need a man in their life. They, they would have liked a man in their life, but 
they didn't need one. And I felt like it was written as though they needed a man in their life. Yeah. Well, that was it. I think there's an underlying thing, and I did hear it quoted at a script to screen conference once that sex sells. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> true. So those sort of like intrigues going on, and you know, God looks across the close curtains parting, you know. Yeah. <laughs> could have been a single woman parting curtains. That would have been, you know. <laughs> but I, no, I think that's a really good question. I, mm. I knew. You'd be hard put to answer it, wouldn't you? Which who was the woman that that did that? Yeah, and who you stayed independent? Chrissy, how did Chris? Because Chrissy and Frank, I remember them having problems in their marriage right towards the end, and I think she went off, she moved away, didn't she? That wasn't to go with another man, there was it, or was it? No, no. I didn't think so. No, it was so funny because um, when I left, it was on Sammy's wedding day. Oh no! I felt she had been Chrissy felt she'd been trapped you know, by a pregnancy, the same way Chrissy had. She'd have to get married. She wanted to be teacher's training, you know, didn't she? But she had yes, to get married. I remember that. He was having to get married, and Chrissy did not agree with this at all. So I thought it was hilarious that in the middle of a wedding party, I left on the wedding day with a hat the size of a wagon wheel, a suit, <laughs> and this suit, and nobody noticed me. <laughs> I had the hat for ages. It was just... Have you still got the hat now? <laughs> uh, I've got, I've got, I do have, I do have quite a few Brookside things, but I just thought, and when we first filmed it, because um, I thought that, you know, the director's going to stop, because I'd, I'd written, kiss this goodbye and pinned it onto the bottom of my suit. Yeah. For the editors yeah. um, that I mightn't see. Um, and then it was, apparently the director hadn't even noticed, so this little joke went horribly wrong. <laughs> and everyone said, we've got to go again. And I said, but he's, why didn't he say cut? And he went, he wasn't watching. Oh, no. <laughs> so I've been in Brookside. And that was the, so we just kissed this goodbye on the back as my little prank. And, yeah, we had to do it again. Oh, no. But well, that wasn't the last we saw of Chrissy, actually, was it? Because I remember she came back a few years afterwards uh, when Frank had died. He died in a car crash uh, yeah. caused by Jimmy Corkill. Well, what was so funny about that, <clears throat> excuse me, we were filming, I think, in St. Helens Crematorium, and it was a very dark day, and we were being very respectful, mm. because there was an actual funeral going on. Oh. That go through before we could be there, so we kept out of the way. So it was all a bit, again, um, you're working in a, a place that real people live, die, mourning, so mm. you've got to be careful. And it was so funny because as the coffin, when we were in the crematorium, as the coffin was going down the aisle, there was this massive thunderstorm. We all expected the lid to come off. Yeah. <laughs> Chrissy! <laughs> I'm not dead. Yes. Frank! <laughs> I was just asleep. <laughs> um, we were sort of waiting for that. So it, again, it was a terribly sad, you're, you're being all very mournful and unhappy. But, but really, you're all laughing, you know, it, it's, um, and it's pulled in for the scene, you know, yeah. so. But they, um, sent off, they sent me off to Japan. Oh. That's where Chrissy was. She oh, Chrissy, sorry, yeah, I thought you meant yourself then. <laughs> uh, well, that was close. Um, but they sent Chrissy off to Japan, so I always joke that, you know, there'd be an accident or something, and I'd come back with a suitcase full of kimonos, <laughs> so you see where I'd be. <laughs> I was riding around on the back of a motorbike in Japan, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> they we didn't film that one. Oh, but sadly, that was the last we saw of Chrissy, wasn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. I'm just going to ask you, because um, there's only a few more questions about Brookside. When you left Brookside, um, were you happy with the way you left? Or did you sort of feel like it was a bit of an anticlimax? Because a few actors I've had on weren't quite happy with their exit. No, I, I think I sort of deserved mine. I think I'd made a bit of a, a nuisance of myself and I think it was a bit of a slap on the wrist. Who'd leave on their daughter's wedding day? Well, if she didn't agree with it, I suppose, but now you remind, I'm going to have to find those episodes out. I can remember that. And the, yeah. It's wearing a cream and black suit with a massive cartwheel on my head. So it was a little bit, I sort of fought for it, but I understood that when it came the time to leave, they sort of said, we can't write for her anymore. Which is just another way of saying your time is up. Move on. Yeah. So and, and, that, and you accept that. That has to. That has to be. You know, accepted. So um, and it was great to be asked back. To be honest. 
Mm. In fact, you know, go back and have that again, see everybody. Um, and I did um, quite recently, I think only a couple of years ago, I got a phone call to see if I would go and be um, a registrar in Hollyoaks. Wow. Yeah. So, and it was really funny because we taken to Peckford and Castle. Nobody sort of quite know where to place me. I wasn't an extra and I wasn't in the cast sort of thing. Um, and it wasn't until we sort of got onto the set and then there was the sound guy, but, Heth, what are you doing here? Oh, mate, brilliant. So then everyone was like, who, who is she? <laughs> and it was lovely because the, um, the assistant director that day was having a time of it with makeup and hair and the whole thing of being on, uh, you know, on location somewhere mm. like Peckerton. And it was this scene where they wanted an owl to fly down from the balcony. It lands. And then I was supposed to go over and take the rings off the owl to bring to the couple getting wed. And I said, he said, there's been a change of script and this is what we want you to do. And I them said, well, I, 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 you know, I'm not sure. I'll only do it in one condition. You could see him going, oh, the day's bad enough. I said, if I'm offset, like, you know, you get loads of scratches on my face and I come back with my hair, hair almost like Tippy Hedron from the birds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just said to me, he went, please say you'll stay. <laughs> it was just <laughs> So it was lovely seeing everybody again, the, the people that knew me. Um, but yeah, like, Renny Krupiniski said he went, I think he did Hollyoaks, um, and he saw a lot of the old cast and stuff yeah. from, oh, sorry, not the cast, a lot of the same crew that was on Brookside, because yeah. I don't know what happened to the parade of shops, I think that's all used for Hollyoaks now, isn't it? Probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a chill war, so, but, but I mean, I, yeah, I, I work with Renny on... Um, radio and stuff like that so it's yeah oh yeah well of course yeah I, I do remember him mentioning you um you would have been in the cast when he was there wasn't he as sister yeah, yeah, yeah. 1987 he was in 1988 so oh yeah he was a scary character a lovely man though in real life lovely man in real life yeah really yeah. nice <laughs> okay well um oh just this one last question on brookside actually um because I'm losing my questions here. I keep doing this, you know, every time I, I lose my place. Because <laughs> um, I personally think there's tremendous um, educational social social history to be found in the 80s era of Brookside. Um, and in fact, it was once said that Brookside became the darling of the left and scourge of right wing media. Would you agree that's an apt description? I, I think because... I think people were well represented. We had the sort of slightly, if I'm right in saying this, the slightly conservative, you know, with Doreen Sloan and her husband, you know. Oh, of course, yes. The upper class, um, they wouldn't vote Labour. But the rest was a reflection of that area of Liverpool hmm. um, during recessions, with everybody coming from very, very working class, normal backgrounds. Hmm. You, you might get, you know, Jonathan. Would Jonathan have voted Labour or whatever? I don't know. I don't... But I do think it was a good reflection of what was happening at the time, because mm. most of the writers were from Liverpool. They were immersed in that life anyway. Mm. And most writers, especially when you're writing so quickly for something, write about what they know. Yeah. We used to say, you know, if you've got um, a Jimmy McGovern script with Ken Horn directing it, you knew you were onto a winner because yeah. you were able to give the best of yourself. Mm. Sometimes you could struggle with a script because it didn't seem to be the way people spoke to each other. Yeah, you know, always come off the page naturally. Um, so you can imagine um, this would be really awkward as well, and, and also harder to learn in a short mm. space, you know. But, um, yeah, but just to show you, I mean, before we go, they're Chrissy's glasses. Oh, wow, <laughs> I definitely like your newer ones. Oh, you my goodness, they're, they're in... heavy, they're like. Guinness bottles, they're, they're like arc welders goggles. They like, they remind me of Deirdre's glasses because Deirdre had huge glasses. What well, those were like, that's what glasses were like. They remind me of my teachers as well. Teachers used to have big glasses like that. I had the curly perm <laughs> and, and the, um, and the arc welders goggles, so there they Well, I do remember actually, because I don't know if it was reflecting real life. I do remember actually um, a scene where Chrissy started to have to wear glasses. And if I remember rightly, she really, really didn't want to. She had, it was quite a big deal. She really hated it. I didn't want to. 
want to. That's what it was. Yeah. I love Bill Redmond because that he he said to me, I want you to wear your glasses because I wear them as Ethna. And I went, yeah. Well, I don't want I and I got special contact lenses for Brookie, you know. Yeah. Um, so I I said, Well, I don't want to wear them because Ethna wears glasses, Chrissy doesn't. And I really sort of argued against it, which is probably another reason I went. Oh, uh, <laughs> really, you know, I did argue against it because I wanted the characters to remain separate for me. And he just said, you've signed a contract. Oh. You're wearing the glasses. So I took it. Who, but, who, who did this come from, sorry? This is Phil Redmond. Oh, Phil Redmond, right. <laughs> so then, but I did get a bouquet of flowers with a thing on the first time I wore them going, love the glasses, thank you, Phil. Oh, so that was a so, nice gesture, yeah. Uh, it's not except like if I sent you a potted plant, would you reconsider contact lenses? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, how was Phil Redmond generally when you worked with him? Um, for me, I, I had, a, I think, a, you know, a reasonable working relationship with Phil. I didn't see him all the time. I probably caused him a fair amount of grief because I was argumentative and I used to argue the toss over things I believed in. Um, That's so good, though. I'm surely they like that show of spirit and you know, passion. <laughs> no? no. <laughs> Just do as you're told. You're under contract. <laughs> but, but recently, um, I, I did a big awards ceremony online for the Liverpool Culture and Creativity Awards. And Phil was... Um, and it was scary because it was in a studio um, up in Bootle, I think, so I see they were absolutely brilliant, the, the people who were filming it. And it was all um, auto cue, you know. Yeah. And I have award ceremonies when everybody's in the room, but this is people on a screen. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it was sort of scary. But then, it, do you know what? It was like walking around Liverpool. Loads of people came up on you. Oh, hi, how are you? <laughs> There's a place. Um, and then I got a really nice, you know, email and stuff from Phil, who was one of the judges, to see. Uh, I can see you've lost none of your spark. And I thought, okay, I'll Aww. take that. But again, I was asked to, um, very movingly asked to be a co-host of the Holocaust Memorial at the Philharmonic a few wow. years ago. Yeah. Um, and Phil had been there in the audience. I was also working at the Royal Court. And it was a beautiful bouquet of flowers to say, what a job well done. So you appreciate that, you know. Yeah. So you've got that going on. I, nice. I mean, I'd love to get Phil Redmond um, on here to chat about Brookside and stuff, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think he's quite a private man, isn't he? He doesn't like social media at all. And I remember once, just without thinking about it, just smoothing his eyebrows, because he had these massive, sort of big, you know, eyebrows, and he went, only my mother's ever done that. I just went, you know, you're doing... <laughs> well, you just... But he's a genius, though, isn't he? He did, you know, what he did was brave and extraordinary. You think you go from Grange Hill into Brookside. Hello, I'd like to buy all of these houses to create a television show about Liverpool out in these leafy suburbs. Yeah, OK, mate. Yeah. And I mean, um, I, I just you know, think, I mean, Brookside was unique and it stood out apart from the other soaps anyway, but that made it even more realistic, obviously, having the, the real houses and stuff. Yeah, and, and it was, um, you know, he employed a heck of a lot of people in Liverpool that wouldn't have had employment. I, I was just thinking about Brookside. I wanted it to survive for the dinner ladies, the carpenters, the film crews, the security guys. Yeah. It's the same as say somewhere like the Royal Court. You get to know these people that people don't see and they're part of that family for you. All right, Seth, that's yeah. what you do every morning, you know. Yeah. And when I go to the Royal Court and John's there on the stage, door, oh, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> John McArdle. <laughs> John, not that John, um, but you know, there's, there's, there's people that the audience don't see that mean a lot to you. Uh, it won't mean anything to them, but they mean something to you. And I want, I always wanted their jobs to be secure, you know. Well, on In, that subject, I mean, what did you, what were your thoughts about Brookside finishing? Oh, I was really sad. Yeah. I, I really, I really was very upset about it. A, because it mm. meant I'd never get back there, you know, I'd always like to mm. go back uh, again. And, um, and just that, I know people thought it had lost its way. Mm. Every All the characters were getting a bit extraordinary. It needed to go back to some of the original writing. Maybe that can't happen. Um, well, right get... at the very end, that's what was so ironic, because 
Phil Redmond had made it. I, when I was looking researching all of this, it was about a year before it was due to finish. And he was basically saying he was going to take the show back to its roots and go back to the ordinary, down more down to earth stories. And I remember thinking, oh, I like the sound of that. And then I think it was only a couple of weeks later, he'd spent a lot of money on this revamp. And then a couple of weeks later, it was announced that it was being shoved into a Saturday afternoon slot. And I thought, well, surely they'd wait and find out how these episodes pan out in the ratings first. But no, once it had gone to Saturday afternoon, I think the writing was on the wall, wasn't it? Because it... yeah, I think so. Um, you're not going to get the money from the advertisers. If your viewing figures drop, you're punished for that. Yeah. But that whole thing. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, but was, uh, what do you think about it coming back now, just out of interest? What well, times the flight from Japan? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know. I honestly don't know. Uh, those houses have been sold. I know you. Of can course, not... yeah. This is what I always tell fans. Yeah. And the last episode, if you remember, the houses were all due to be demolished, and all the characters, apart, you know, even Jimmy was going off. They were all going to off to pastures new. So yes. if it ever came back, how on earth, one, the close isn't there, and two, how on earth would you explain everybody suddenly being back on Brookside Close? You just couldn't, could you? And, and I think that would just... Uh, unless Jimmy Corker woke up and it was all a dream, of course. That's exactly what <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah, it was sad. Dean Sullivan yeah. comes up to the shark where he's been for the last 20 years and goes, it was all a dream. He's yeah. a bit his skin's a bit wrinkled and could do with a bit of conditioner, but <laughs> it, it, it is, you, you hope beyond hope that certain elements of it could be recreated again, but I, I, I don't know how they do that. I like the idea of what Lewis Emmerich had said, and basically if it were to ever come back, then a new cast and perhaps just like the cameo appearances from some of the old cast, and I thought, well, that sounds quite good. I, you could, I mean, if you actually do that, you could have people who were in the original cast, mm. Um, in this new place, mm. and that is your ideal connection. Yeah, or like, well, like a whole es an estate on Liverpool, and then it sort of makes a bit more sense because if they're all living next door to each other, it's a bit like, well, how on earth did they yeah. all end up living back next door to each other again? Yeah, but yeah. you could somebody could come and visit and go, well, that house is up for sale. So yes. then you've got two families in, yeah. and then people come and visit them. I'll come back as a single woman and then you can look at, you know, what you've always wanted to, just that, you know. Yeah, I mean, would you go back as Chrissy Rogers, actually? Oh, gosh, yeah, I know Japanese now. And uh, <laughs> I could actually probably be a fully-fledged teacher now, couldn't I? Yeah, of course. So I could come back and teach the children of the younger generation of Brookside actors who would have all had children by now. Oh, yes. You know, that's it. So I could be teaching my own grandchild. Yes, of course. Yeah, so that's it. And as a single independent woman, just making my own food of a night and going out on the lash. Yeah, that <laughs> sounds good to me. <laughs> well, well I just want... Go on, sorry. Not to the fair. Not to the fair. Oh, yeah, not to the fair, of course. Not to the fair. Well, uh, this is a question. I'm sure... Mm, I bet you get really bored of hearing this because I imagine everybody asks you this question, but... Do you know what happened to uh, Peter Christian, who played Frank, and Diane Burke? Because um, I often get asked this, these questions. Oh, can you get them on for an interview? And I'm like, oh, well, of course. But I've never uh, been able to find them. I, I should think Peter's retired by now, because I he's a, maybe a couple of years older than me, and I finally got my pension. Yes. Oh, well done. <laughs> this, um, which I'm never bothered about. So um, no. the time I saw Peter was at... Um, Production at the Everyman. Was that the one where he tapped you on the... Sh oh, no, that was Katie. Sorry, sorry, that was Katie. Yeah, the it? lovely Diane Burke. Yeah. Uh, Diane Burke went into... She looks after an agency now, I think. She was quite happy to come away from... Um, the, the You know, you, you know the, the sort of, like, everybody knowing who she was. Yeah, the celebrity side of it. Yeah, and, and she's got her family. And I think she was working just off London Road at one point for an agency there. Uh, we bumped into each other and it was joyous, absolutely joyous. Um, but Peter, I'm not too sure. I think he's probably retired. I know he lives on the Wirral, so there's less chance that we'd ever bump into each other. Yeah. Uh, just trying to think. So I think the very last time I saw him was in the distance and he was carrying a potted plant. Oh, wow. <laughs> or, you know, when gardens open? Yeah. Um, I think, I think that that was it, but yeah. 
Oh, it's a shame. Mm. I mean, if we, if we ever do get in touch, manage to get in touch with him, I obviously will invite him on to do a reunion if he likes that sort of thing. Yes. <laughs> um, well, question 12. Not too many questions now. Um, don't worry. Um, I do this. I, I'm, I'm always on longer than I expect, you see, with guests and stuff. Are you okay to answer these next couple of questions? Of course. Yes. Oh, good. Thank you. Because I do babble on a lot. Um, because, of course, Brookside wasn't the only soap you've done. As several years later, you appeared in uh, Emmerdale and last year, Coronation Street. So obviously a lot of time had lapsed in between those roles and Brookside. So um, I was talking to Sheila about this last week. So I imagine you must have noticed a difference um, as these days. I gather you don't get rehearsal time anymore. You did on Brookside, didn't you? You do. You did get a little. Um, I was... I was talking about this just the other day when I was doing like a teaching call mm. and it's a completely different skill in on to, because television costs so much mm. to produce you've really got to be on the ball you've got to do your work beforehand and you've got to be able to just come in do a quick line run um and then right we'll shoot this mm. so, all so no this, pressure <laughs> But so all of the subtleties that you might be able to bring out in the rehearsal period, mm. um, you haven't really got that. But the gorgeous thing is if you make a mistake or you've got a bit flat, you can go again. Yeah. You can't have that out in the theatre. Um, and that's why I loved working, um, you know, on Emmerdale uh, with Ryan's real mum, our lovely girl, because she would, she just said, you'll act with me. You'll act with me. Come on, come on, come on. Give me more, give me more. So I have to say, Emma Dale was an extraordinarily, it was, an it was a really happy experience from start to finish. Yeah. Um, I had a wonderful time on it. Big warm welcome as soon as I came in. And it went on that way. I saw people I knew from oh, other lovely. places. Um, and I loved staying over in Leeds. You know, I had a little, one of those little apartment places on my own. You know, Neil came over. It was, it was a really good, positive experience. And um, Coronation Street? Coronation Street, again, again, great. Really good. Um, again, the lovely guy I was playing with, Dan, we had such a laugh. Nobody realised how we were talking to each other off the camera. <laughs> I was there. It was my work with Ian Hayler that did it. You know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, I'm more hot. More hot. I shouldn't be here. <laughs> but it was wonderful once the cameras went there. Again, he was exactly the same. Oh, you'll act with me. You'll act with me. This is great. Please, you know. So so we, we could enjoy ourselves once the camera was on and it was all for real. Mm. And the cameras were off. You know, we'd just tease each other. Could I suggest you? No, don't. <laughs> I'm talking. You know, it's all of those little silly things um, that help developing that, you know, a relationship, mm. trust and humour, so that when you go for the heavy stuff, it's all there. Mm. It's all, I heard that recently, um, just a quick name drop, uh, about three, four weeks ago, they're filming, um, they were filming in Liverpool, and it's called Dali Land, and it's about Salvador Dali, mm -hmm. and Sir Ben Kingsley was playing Dali. And wow. I got, what, really, it was one line and a raised eyebrow. <laughs> and... Um, it was a situation at a table with all these various actors sat about it. And I am actually on the credits as old socialite. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and how did you feel about that? You know what? I was made up to just get the part. This film was supposed to be filmed in Canada and Spain. And because of COVID, it was filmed in Anglesey and Liverpool. <laughs> So no, like, no grand location filming or anything. I wouldn't have got it. They'd have, they'd have taken somewhere near the location. So um, so I had this fantastic oh, dress on. I was like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dali, uh, you know, what are you working on now? Just Ooh. literally. Ah, I thought, somebody asked me, I tell you. And it, it was one line and it was like, oh, really? Um, <laughs> I was there all day and it was great, but... Rupert Graves, the actor, I had that relationship with him. You know, he sort of said, um, I could show you how to do that better. And I said, I've seen your work. And if I liked it, I suppose I'd listen to you, but I don't. And so we just had that <laughs> fun. Yeah. That way, you can be still and, you know, it's, it helps the day go. It's nice. 
Yeah, mm. you've got to have the banter, haven't you? And it obviously helps if you're getting on with the people around you. Because I can't imagine acting and stuff with people that you don't get on with. I can imagine that would be a really negative well, experience. It can be. It really mm. can be. But, you know, it's the same as any family. Mm. When, you're, when you're on stage with somebody, normally you've got like a seven-week contract, three-and-a-half-week rehearsal, three-and-a-half-week on stage. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to be like a family then. You don't get on with every auntie, do you? No. But you with them and take care of them. Yeah, of course. But the, uh, you know, even if it's somebody that could be being difficult or rude or sometimes, you, you know. You've just got to put that all away when you're on stage. Yeah, hopefully mm. you do. And you then you get the best out of what's on that stage, you know. And it's not forever. It's not no. forever. But generally, I mean, a happier set is a more productive one, I think. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I know Rennie was saying exactly that last uh, a couple of weeks ago when I had him on, because I know he said to the first words that Paul Usher had said to Rennie was, um, "You've got big boots to fill." I said, "Does that make you nervous?" And he goes, "Just a bit." He meant as in like Tommy McArdle who had come before him. <laughs> so I can imagine that must have been really nerve wracking on the first day. Yeah. Now, of course, I'd love to get Paul Usher on, but I know he's a very private person as well. Did you have yeah. much to do with Paul? Um, very, very rarely, really, did our paths cross. Mm. And um, but he was, you know, he, he was good laugh because yeah. Sheila, you know, so Jono and I were friendly. So Sheila was, you know, any Sheila scenes, we'd have been having a laugh anyway. Yeah. But but certainly we wouldn't have socialised together or yeah. you know, that sort of thing. But because um, he's yeah. a musician as well, isn't he? Yeah. Well, you don't get to explore these things, on you? No, know? I only saw it on YouTube. It was from about twenty five years ago. He's yeah. Had got a good voice on him. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's a pity that more people don't know about these things. I think. I think they did. They did ask me to sing mm. on Brookside, and I just said no. It just no. I did it. Well, it just seemed the way it was done. It just seemed one of those slightly ooh things yeah. to do. You know? Oh, I see. Suddenly, Chrissy gets up drunk and gives voice, and uh, you know, you don't sort of. Who is she then? You know, <laughs> if that, and it was only because they'd heard me sing at a concert. You know, it's like. Oh right, you can do, we'll do that then. I just thought, when Chrissy wouldn't, you know, wouldn't suddenly get up on stage and stop singing. But no, I couldn't imagine unless she was really drunk, perhaps. Yeah. Chrissy drunk? Oh no, Chrissy doesn't do drinking, does she? No, she's far too sensible for that. Yes, or and smoking. You, <laughs> how dare you suggest it? <laughs> oh. Well, moving on from Brookside, um, I just want you to... Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh... Oh, we've spoken about this. There was another question. Just We've spoke about working with John McArdle and Michael Stark um, again. So I'm hoping that Michael will come on. If you're watching, Michael, hi. Please come on with Efna so we can talk about your new play. Um, I just want you to tell us about uh, your one-woman show that you did recently. And are there any plans for more dates when theatres hopefully reopen soon. So I imagine that must have been devastating as well, because I think that was planned before lockdown, wasn't it? Well, it was just one of those things. I've, I've, I've done it before. We use it, as I say, Blackburn House. And then um, I, was, I was going to be performing at the, uh, the beautiful Palm House in Sefton Park, mm. where I was before. And that was just... There are some things that happen sometimes in your life and you go, how did I get here? Yeah. I was I was in the Palm House. I've got the, Roz, this beautiful pianist accompanying me, and I'm singing my heart out, and I'm looking at all the faces and the bulbs and the flowers and the plants. You just go, I used to come wow. in here. As, I used to come in here as a kid. So I think it's occasionally life does that to you and it pulls you back a little bit and you just go, how did, I, this is great. How did I get here? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, I, at the moment, what I'm really enjoying doing and quite proud of doing is um, a very good friend of mine who is an actress and now works through John Moore's University, um, has developed this doorstop theatre where we've been going the past two weeks oh. to various housing schemes where older people have been locked down. Yeah. It has to be outside and they have to come and join us or look through the window. We have had a ball. That sounds wonderful. So you're entertaining the elderly, basically. More than that, really. We we interview people so that the, the stories that we tell are theirs. They, yes. They'll know. 
and it's about you know about life in lockdown but again it's not oh, it's funny and the three positive actors, and uplifting it's we they're like please come again we've not seen anything like this we've not seen anything and one of the oh. best things in honestly was this amazing woman one of them she would call june 92 years old you wouldn't have believed it but we're doing all these little monologues telling all of these different stories changing characters but june would approach each one so we're having a conversation with her She'd be like, oh did he oh yeah. right oh oh what did that feel like and it was just i was trying to work with that and I was playing this character who, I'm in this home while I'm waiting for my sixth husband to come along. You know, she's one of those. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And when husband number three died, oh, did he? And just, <laughs> I'm carrying on. She goes, and how is he now, love? I'm like, well, he's still dead, June. <laughs> <laughs> still dead last time I checked. <laughs> oh, yeah. He enjoys singing and dancing. You, they want to hug you and they can't and you can't touch them and you're desperate. Um, and watching the staff, the people who are looking after them, it's been really, really heartwarming. And yeah. I was doing one in Walton uh, last Monday and I'd had a chance to chat with a few people beforehand. We're talking about my name with a lovely lady called Bridget. And before I left, she came up, I've got it here. She gave me a pot of shamrock. She, she still had the dirt on her finger. She did <laughs> give to me um, to take it with you. And uh, she said, it's from my own garden, from home. Oh. And you just like, in her little hanky, take this away and you go, oh, and, and it's- Thank a, you. <laughs> and you just, you've done that for me, thank you. Yeah. So it's that. Nice. So I'm hoping for more of those. Um, I know that Mama Mia has been canceled for another year this summer. Oh. So, um, I know, I know, I know, but you just have to go, okay. In the meantime, there's going to be a fantastic play at the Royal Court, um, or a couple coming up. Um, Drew and Lindsay are getting ready one, uh, for one. Um, and that's, uh, I just think that's going to be on, I'm not exactly sure. Um, Ellen and Rigby. So that'd be, you know, Drew Schofield and yes. Lindsay Jermaine. Great. Wow. It's going to be directing it. So that's quality. Yeah. And then, play about home bake just coming on there as well so you know there's a lot of good stuff happening around the the theatres I'm just not part of it yet yeah so uh, well you will be I bet you so what are your plans for the future as well apart from well, um things change all the time I've just received an email to ask me uh am I available to go to Manchester to do some what they call R&D research and development um on a new piece of work there I love new writing and yeah. I, I love to work on it with new young authors, you know, help them develop their skills because it's the lifeblood. We have to have new work in the theatre. Um, that, so that's really good. Um, some more of this, I'm going to be working in Halton. Um, so yeah, this sort of takes me into June, um, July. And then after that, I'll see. Just have to keep like we don't have any security Even well that's it the nature of the beast yeah Sheila was saying last week because of course back in the 80s um you know you were obviously not like mobiles now or emails you were just literally waiting for the phone to ring do you remember that oh of course yeah I got told off once by a partner because the first thing I did when I got in was go straight to the answer phone <laughs> have I got any work yeah but <laughs> well, that's I, eager I, and passion asking me to get you know a little pager and my friend's daughter getting one for me because I was like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so I remember those messages coming, go, please ring your agent. And yes. you can't even Thank now, God I've got work. You've got, you know, if you've got an email, you can't be an actor unless you can take the word no. Yeah, I suppose rejection is the main aim of the game because I suppose you get rejected a lot. Get, my thing is, my philosophy is, if I haven't signed a contract, my name isn't on the contract. It was never my role. It was never no, my play. Never meant to be. It. sometimes I've been told no um been disappointed and then I've got a phone call like a while later going come and do this because we know you can do it once I got seen for a beautiful play up at the Dukes in Lancaster mm. uh, to play one character and I happened to say something about the housewife character mm. and they were like oh would you read for that and she sings would you sing and all of that so I got the character 
of this lovely skinny Polish housewife. I'd just been dumped, so I lost loads of weight. I was perfect for it. Yeah. And um, and the actor who actress who thought it should have been her was really quite annoyed with me, but you know, oh. I was, <laughs> it went to you. <laughs> it did, and it was beautiful to do. And it that sort of came, you know, out of the blue. No, we won't want you to play the big nitro art character. We'd like to play the the So as one door closes, another door opens. Yeah. Like, that. like that. And sometimes you you'll get you'll get offered work and you just think. Oh my God, yeah, I can absolutely do that. Yeah, thank you, yeah. thank you. Maggie May was like that. Uh, so I'm hoping that comes back. There was a, a dedication in the play to say Ethna Brown was our Maggie from the start. And it, when I read that, I was like, oh, oh yeah. that's how you thought about me. I didn't. But, <laughs> well, that's nice though. That's a really com a lovely compliment though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it, was, it was, you know, it's a way to carry in its compliment, but that that can happen those nice things can happen um and in the meantime you you go off you do the different jobs somebody contacted me today about doing some teaching um mm. that's that's great you know like yeah. workshops um that would be lovely thank you very much yeah <laughs> so, yeah i mean it sounds anyway. like you've got quite a lot of things on the go it's you know you've got plenty of direction and one path will lead to another yeah i think i i i've just said i mean you know I know I've been, can you use the word lucky? It's such a horrible time. Um, last year, um, Vera Lynn died, so I got to go and be her in the um, Western Approaches. Oh, I got wow. to sing a song that my mother would have sung, dressed in an original Wren's outfit. Wow. And that my father's ship would have been directed at. You know, it was quite an experience. Mm. And then there's another wonderful, wonderful woman um, called June Furlong. She was an artist model at um, the Liverpool Institute when John Lennon was there. Wow. So there's work done with June yeah. she, recently. But she was painted by Lucy and Freud and Frank Auerbach, and they asked me to be her for some recordings. So they'd recorded her voice when, uh, before she died, and would I do that? So, you know, with that... Yeah, I've that, been very busy then, you know, lately. And I mean, you've always had lots of TV roles as well throughout the career, haven't you? And theatre roles. I've, I've done... I think theatre's been the, the main body of the work has come from theatre and I've done... Yeah. I've gone on tours and national tours or you've got to be prepared to travel. Mm. One of the nicest things that happened was I, I got asked back to Vienna oh, three times. Right. It was, it was, it was. You don't get paid much. You mm. don't, because um, it's a little little English theatre that's paying you but to go there and then they give you money for being there. You feel like um, I'm being paid for this for so much fun. <laughs> you want me to and yeah especially one they actually said to me we're really sorry it's only a small role you come on in act three um, and sort of give the game away it wasn't so much a murder mystery with you knew who'd done it but were they going to get away with it. Mm. So Miss Brown ambles on in Act 3 with a hat like the Harvest Festival singing Jesus wants me for a sunbeam. <laughs> Do I get paid the same as everybody else? <laughs> I'm put me down then for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. it sounds like you've got loads on the go. Just got to ask you this final question because of going off what we said and having all these experiences. Um, would you ever consider, or have you ever considered, penning your memoirs? No. Um, you know, every Brookside actor I've had on said, no, Sue Jenkins, I think I'd asked, and Mike, no. So it's not something you consider. No, there's, you just, you either think, I've, I've been asked a few times because the way I started in the business was extraordinary. Mm. In that, I got asked to do Blood Brothers, um, the original Blood Brothers in 1982. In 83, we went to London and mm. um, Barbara Dixon fell over and I went on in her clothes. Wow. Now, up till then, when I got the phone call, um, somebody said, hello, you don't, know, you don't know me, but I believe you can sing. And I was like, oh, here we go. I'll <laughs> sing down. And all my mates will be creased at the other end. Um, but it was a guy from the, the Liverpool Playhouse. He mm. was doing the music. And I was selling Venetian blinds in a shop up London Road at the time. You know, Neil and I were together and whatever work I needed to do to keep him and I body and soul and food and wherever yeah. he was schooled. So I was working in a Venetian blind shop when I got the 
call to go and play uh, in Blood Brothers. I remember the guy who owned the Venetian blind shop didn't think I should take it. Yeah. He didn't think you should take it. Oh, oh. Well, I'm glad. I bet you don't. I bet you think. Look back and think. I'm glad I did. Now, aren't you? I could still sell you Venetian blinds, obviously, but but it was. Oh, you can if you want. <laughs> mom and dad. My mom and dad were absolutely right behind you. Going, you have to do this. We got the. You just, you know, um, and so that's how it started. And wow. I did over fifty shows in the West End. Wow. Um, and I remember that very first night they asked me to go on as Barbara Dixon. You know, I, I was on the seventh floor where we still had gas jets coming out the wall, you know, um, <laughs> and we had to run up and down stairs to the stage, whereas Barbara is in dressing room number one. And she'd not been very well. Um, and then it was like 20 past seven and she wasn't going to go on. Oh. So they had to put me in her clothes. This is hilarious because she's five foot seven mm. and, very, and she was very slender. I'm five foot two and not. She takes a size seven shoe. I took a four. Mm. So they, they had to stick newspaper up her shoes. <laughs> the clothes were warm off her body. Ian, this is true. <laughs> they had to pin the dress clothes, put me in that big coat that Mrs. Johnson wears in Blood Brothers. I look, I, I, I always say I look like dopey off the dwarves. And, just... <laughs> and so I had all these huge clothes on. It looked like I'd dressed him in Anne's clothes. And I remember... Oh. At the side of the stage, I'm going, you know, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Barbara Dixon will not be appearing. And a big groan, oh. Like, uh, you've all paid £10 to see a Venetian blind saleswoman. <laughs> <laughs> so no and pressure on you and no nerves on you, though. <laughs> yeah, I don't know whether it was shock, but it was. I was completely calm and still. And then all of a sudden it was, tell me it's not true. Say it's just a story. And we're off. Carry on. <laughs> uh, but that's how it happened. All of a sudden, these notes came in and you were singing and you were away. Yeah. And, um, and that was it. And a lot of people were like, oh, you've got to stay in London to make the most of this. Mm. But I had Neil in Liverpool and I, yeah. I, I was a bit lonely in London on my own. I was 28 and away from home for the first time, really. Yeah, of course. But and obviously... Everybody, well, you were partying together, but in London, everybody disperses to where they are. So I ended up working in the box office in the theatre. Wow, no way. <laughs> Just something to do during the day, you know, it was like, but it was a great learning experience, you know, first one. Mm. And fate took you on to Brookside and there are. Yeah. Oh, I will tell you one thing. Um, I had friends with somebody on Facebook um, that played your husband in Clocking Off. Jeff Merchant. <laughs> yes. He said hello. I do remember he told me to say hello. I've just remembered that. Yeah. <laughs> Can you remember Jeff? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you remember things like that. that that's real. Yeah. That, oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. do get on. We, uh, we're Facebook friends. We've argued and disagreed over Madonna. He's very, very anti-Madonna, which, and I'm like for Madonna, but no, we've agreed to disagree on that. <laughs> Apart from that, we get on great. <laughs> so... Yeah, that, that's you, you can be friends and disagree, can't you? Yes, of course, of course, which yeah. is a good thing, really, because I seem to disagree with lots of people, a lot of my friends at the moment with certain things, so... <laughs> if people bring different things to the table, and you should respect that, you know, and if you don't... Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Ethna, it's been absolutely lovely. Well, this isn't going to be the, first, uh, the last time I see you, obviously, because... Uh, it'll be around July time. I'm going to have to start working out dates where everybody's going to be available. I know it's going to be a nightmare, but I took it on, so it's up to me to sort it. Still have no idea how this is going to pan out. There's about 15 of you on. Um, Stephen Parry. Did you ever meet Stephen Parry? Uh, yeah. Oh, of course you did. I know you've spoken before. Stephen Parry, I'm going to hopefully have a Zoom session with him and he's going to help me. I thought it'd be quite funny to get you all to, especially now you're a singer, maybe get you to do a song or something, isn't it? Jokey way, a Liverpool theme song. What do you think? Yes, I'm because otherwise, that's no. one thing of you, you know, all of you together. Because otherwise, I'm gonna have to speak to all of you individually because you can't you have do. 15 people all talking at once. Um, but you, you do, you do get that thing of you know, most people, a lot of people who who are actors are, are singers as well, and yeah, you know, as well. I know, I know, yeah, quite a lot of people who you know, 
Oh, so I'll that, get you that, all to do solos then. Can I put you down as a so for a solo then? <laughs> it depends. I'll get you doing a Madonna number, like a virgin okay. or something. <laughs> Would you like that? Like a very old virgin. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I honestly thought maybe like a Liverpool theme song, uh, like You Never Walk Alone, or even The Farms, um, All Together Now, or something, because that's quite an anthem, isn't it? Uh, and funnily enough, I've got the, those two boys um, on next week, Peter Hooton and uh, um, Keith Mullin. Yeah, do, yeah. do you know them? I, well, just, just through that, I, I won't claim as friends or whatever, but we certainly nod to each other and say hello and how are you and stuff like that. Only because they were, they were Brookside fans. Yeah, you, they, you know each other from, you know, and Carl, I did um, I, I did a small scene in a film for Carl, oh. uh, some who directed, it was called Sometimes, Always, Never, um, with Bill Nye in the lead. Oh. And I played um, like a, just a, well, a small part again, which was a wonderful character um, in this amazing sort of little, restaurant with Sam Riley, who was playing Bill's son. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I just had the best 24 hours in York. Yeah. I go over to York to film. I was staying in a really nice hotel. It was, I remember it was November. Uh, I was taken off to, you know, to the location. The uh, guy doing costumes was brilliant. We'd gotten so well together. And, um, I looked amazing. You know, it was one of those things. I had the hair was all swept up. I had bosoms, my, like, <laughs> they were like bullets. They're amazing. <laughs> uh, especially made apron to just for this little scene and so when you get that attention to detail the film itself is beautiful I mean, you know it's 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 winning awards around festivals now um oh, but, but carl from the farm was the director wow i'm hoping he'll join in as well but i didn't know he was directing as well so that's something i could speak to him about yeah. if he comes oh, on God. next week yeah he's 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 um it's and it's always lovely to see him always great to see him. you you have a shared history of that time in liverpool don't you, mm. you know, oh. i was you know, i was performing on brookside they were performing on stage uh, that whole sort of thing around the 80s around lark lane about you know it's it was um yeah it was you know it was part of it's you're growing up isn't it yeah, of course. That's why I'm so thrilled to have all of you on, because obviously Brookside was something from my childhood. And the farm, I was buying their records when I was uh, about, oh, God, I was 10 or 11. Groovy yeah. train and all together now. I still remember going down Woolies and seven Harry, inch singles. Harry Cross, didn't they? Oh, yes. Bill, because yes. he was, I, I think there's a link there, because Bill Dean was a train driver before, wasn't he? And that's why they got him on doing the groovy train. Yeah. I the, he smiled in that video more than I ever saw him smile in Brookside, which I loved. <laughs> love Bill. I love Bill. We, I got on so well with him. He was... Um, you did quite a few good scenes with him as well. Yeah, he, he was... We loved working together. Um, there was never any, you know, one-upmanship or whatever. Gorgeous to work with him. And he would give you great advice mm. uh, as to how to play something or whatever. This is what I would like to do. This is... So you did have that prep with him. And, and I'd see him, um, you know, I'd, I'd see him um, off screen as well. Uh, he was absolutely lovely. I, I, I was very, very fond of him. Very fond, yeah. Great guy. He's a great me. actor as well. I mean, I have to say when I was very little, first watching Brookside back in the early, eight, in the mid eighties, um, I found him quite scary. He used to strike me as like some mean, nasty old man that if I was naughty would, lock me up in a dark cellar or something and Harry Cross probably would do something like that, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you forget about the Bill Dean, you know, and the work that he'd done before he came to Brookside. Yeah, well, I, I've seen him in Scum. I know he's done a lot more than that, of course. Yeah. You know, he was great because he lived, he moved to just up the road. So he had it all sorted. It was, it was the way he wanted his life to be, mm. you know, the, the latter stages. And he, <laughs> I loved him. He said, I'll see you coming up the drive, but don't see a bottle of whiskey in your hand. Door's staying closed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard he was quite a spirited kind of person. Yeah. Well, he was, no, he was, he was great. And great to spend time with, just to listen to him, you know. Yeah, Not I can imagine. A, a, a good actor, but a very good raconteur. Mm. Lovely. Brilliant. Very happy memories. Very happy memories, and it's been lovely hearing all about your memories now. So, what time are we on now? We've been going for an hour and 20 minutes, and it feels like 20 minutes to me, doesn't it? No, I'm glad. Honestly, every time we start talking, it goes, it feels like 20 minutes. 
Has it gone fast for you? I can't believe it's an hour and 20 minutes. Though. No, I mean, I, I'm normally on this for this long anyway. And that's why I was sort of saying, are you okay to sort of, because I, I, I write too many questions probably, but once I start, I get carried away once I start. So I'm glad that you've stayed and I hope I haven't kept you too long. <laughs> no, no, if there's anything else you'd like to finish with or whatever, please do. No, no, that... I've got everything. Well, we've got, there's more to come, but that will probably be on the reunion um, thing. We'll save that till now. And then I'm sure that when we speak next time in July, you'll have more to tell me anyway as well. <laughs> of course you will, fingers crossed. Fingers have you enjoyed it? Were the questions okay for you? Oh my gosh, oh yeah. Oh, oh God. That's upset me or whatever. And in fact, it's nice to be able to talk uh, about things that aren't just bookside related so that people get an idea of your life yeah i've started doing that with actors yeah. so um, rather than just talking about brookside i always talk about what you did before and what you're doing now yeah. and all before after you know yeah. so people try and give it a bit of a well-rounded view yeah and also you just get that person then i think once you know the person you can see the little lines to the character and go yeah, she she definitely was Chrissy at that moment, and mm. you know all of those things. So yeah, yes. I think it's, but also, I think it's important to realise that like, we are just other people. When I, some of the stuff I found hard to accept when I was doing Brookside was that people would try and elevate you. Oh, I can't believe it's you. Well, it, it is me. I live here, and you know. Um, no way. <laughs> Oh, not at all. No, I sometimes think it, it, I might have upset people by not being actressy enough, you know, mm. or whatever. Because I'll still get, aren't you Chrissy? To this day, to this day. And I'm glad because I'll set up a conversation with somebody that I might never have spoken to. Yeah, it's a real icebreaker, isn't it? Yeah. They might know somebody you know, it's got nothing to do with Brookside. Did you? Oh, I can't believe that. And it's great. So, and I've always said as well, you know, for me, if I'm having a bit of a downer, you know, if I get off the bus at the top of Bell Street, by the time I've hit Church Street, I've nodded or smiled or, you know, it's 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 a great lifter. Um, and and that that that's lovely. People are, you know, just I, I think I have that. Um, I think I think a lot of people, Liverpool people, have as well. If this is just what we do. Yeah. I, I don't need the fuss. Mm. I'll do it. So it's for nice you. to feel appreciated. It's only because they love, uh, you know, they just, really enjoy your work, of course. Oh, I do, and I and I do feel blessed that you know I've given given the opportunity to, you know, to be still working now. Yeah. So, um, and work in the pipeline as well. Yeah, there are there are there are things coming up. Um, and fingers crossed they come up. But after last year, you just think, right, well, okay, you know, play it by ear. Kind of thing. I've had my Diana Ross concert cancelled two times, twice now. So hoping that's going to happen next year. Well, my my Neil, poor Neil is is who concert was cancelled, and that's devastating. Yeah, I was devastated, and then somebody told me off on Twitter saying this is not a sad story, Ian, and I was like, no, I'm not saying it's sad, but it was. I'm very disappointed. It is sad. It is yeah, sad. It is that 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 rush that you get from a live concert music and stuff we, Neil and I were talking about it the other day many many years ago before I first ever worked there Neil and I got tickets to go and see a Stones tribute band oh, wow. at the Royal Court and everything was everybody was seated I had a bulb and um, they were absolutely brilliant and I think that they call the counterfeit stones mm. and at one point the music was just so good I just said you know, I'm really sorry I'm going to embarrass you now and I got up and went to dance with a few. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> in mum, you know. <laughs> the next thing is, I just had this tap on my shoulder. There he is, giving it loads behind me. So <laughs> it, that thing that music makes people feel, and you know, if you're in a choir or if you're sharing music and noise and excitement, I think it loses yeah. your inhibitions as well. The music, if you want to dance and stuff as well. It, yeah, and it doesn't matter what your life is. I, I've seen children, I did some work with the Philharmonic, and I've seen children absolutely enthralled by classical music. Mm. You allow them to enjoy it. Um, and then, you know, I've seen Neil get very emotional about somebody he loves being on stage, singing them live. And it's that thing, isn't it? Lost in music. Yeah, you definitely do. lost in music, absolutely. So... Third love of that person or that thing with all of these people. And, you know, it's all oh, been giving it plenty. Oh, 
so missed it. It's the adrenaline, the absolute atmosphere and stuff. And that's what we were saying before we came on air. I really do miss it. And you just don't, you take these things for granted. Now, now yeah. that I've actually gone, that's when you can sort of look and think, right, well, I really miss that. And now I can, I will appreciate it from now on a lot more. And I think we have to be careful that we do get this back. Because yeah. I do think there's a tendency, showing more and more and more, to sideline certain things. Mm. Uh, I don't just mean, oh, it's the arts. Uh, it, the lack of funding for things like music and theatre. Um, the lovely thing about the Royal Court is that they, the amount of people I've spoken to in the Royal Court who went, we never thought theatre was for us. And they go there and they experience that. Mm. We have to be careful that we don't lose that. No, definitely. You'll never, walk alone. you'll never sing alone, you'll never act alone. Let's make it, you know, widespread. So the things that we're so proud about in this city, our art, our all of it, mm. you know, that makes people want to come to Liverpool. Let's make sure we keep that alive and pushing. The younger people now today, they've missed out on a year of life. Come on. Let's... Do you know, I don't, I really can't imagine what I would have reacted like as a, because I suppose at that age, when you're a teenager, you just want to be out with your mates, don't you? Or... You. Yeah. you want to be, you, you want to be doing the concerts and the singing and the so-and-so and, 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 and getting a, you know, getting a job in telly or in theatre or, or, you know, on a radio or whatever, all of those things, they just seem to be closing in and in and in. And our young people deserve the opportunity to express themselves the same way we have. And we know it's good. It's, yeah. you know, yeah. Oh. That was talking. <laughs> no, no, I think that was a very nice, positive way to end the interview. I think that was a nice, positive way because even though lockdown has been horrible, I'm, we're all, it's like Sheila said, we're trying to take something positive away from it as well. Because yeah. it's made me know where I want to go in my life as well. Yeah. I love doing these interviews, you see, and I want to get into radio and stuff. And, you know, I was plowing along before and now since lockdown, it's like, why am I just drifting along on things I don't like doing? Do what it's in your, your you know, what your heart to. So. At least give it a go. What, come on, mate. Yeah. And if I fail, I can say, well, at least I tried. No, you won't fail. No, I won't fail. That's what I'm going to say. I've, I've got into that mindset now saying, like, if I really want it, I will make my way there and I'll find a way. You will. Yeah. Thank I'm you. I'm not there already. <laughs> well, yeah, I know I should. What's that, sorry? You sound as though you are. Oh, thank you. Well, oh, I don't get told that very <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that. I'm blushing now for that nice little compliment there. Thank you, Ethna. <laughs> well, I, you, I shall, if I ever get a professional job, you'll be the first I'll let know. Yeah, please do. Yeah. You know. Oh, Ethna, listen, it's been a lovely pleasure and... What I shall do now is I shall go and, well, once I've had something to eat, I shall go and uh, read all the comments and send you the link to YouTube because I'll put it on YouTube afterwards. And uh, okay. yeah, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in July. I'm going to give you a blow kiss now. I haven't no. done this to anybody before. I'm going to do really mwah, the lovely thing. Mwah, mwah. I was just thinking, oh my goodness me, of course. I'd, it's not just been us, has it? No, no, no. We've got a crowd watching now. I have no idea who's been watching, how many's been watching. I know quite a few people have been watching, so I'm dying to see what the comments are now. So, <laughs> and I'll share the video onto Twitter afterwards. All right. Well, just take care, everybody. Take care of yourselves. We're nearly there. And I hope to see you all soon somewhere. Yeah. And I will see you very soon, Ethna. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for being a star guest. You've been brilliant tonight. <laughs> Bye -bye, brilliant lovely honest i've really enjoyed it that's it and uh, we'll be going again in july before you know it <laughs> oh so only another few months away now we're into may aren't we so it's only another few months so real. <laughs> that's something to look forward to isn't it yes it is it is Take right care. i'm going to say good night and i'll speak to you very later efna thank you very much again very well <laughs> and good night to everybody okay Bye, Ethna. See you soon. Bye-bye.